seated. Today we look at one of the final gospel accounts of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. Um, We've been in that mysterious time between Easter and Pentecost where preachers work really hard to help us understand the mysteries of the faith. Today's reading comes to us from John chapter 21 verses 1 through 19. Hear these words. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the living out of this word that we share. We have talked a lot about um, how... Difficult it was for these early disciples to recognize Jesus in his resurrected body. Um, We have talked about how overwhelming the circumstances were for them to go from the triumphal entry when they figured... Um, They figured everything was about to happen just as they expected that there was going to be this new kingdom that Israel was no longer going to be a vassal state of Rome and only to find that in, in the span of five short days that Jesus went from being hailed as the son of David, as Messiah, to being nailed to a Roman cross. We've talked about how the people that called for Jesus' death were not among the people who hailed him on on the day that he entered Jerusalem. In fact, the people that called for his death were the priests and scribes, the, the officers of the law. These people belonged to the party of the Sadducees. And they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And these people had something like a Jewish mafia about 
Seven families, roughly 120 people. And these were the folks that made the decisions in those smoke-filled rooms behind closed doors. They were the political machine, truly the mafioso, the Jewish mafioso of their day. And they were the ones who decided that it was expedient for Jesus to die. They were the ones that decided that Jesus was going to upset the status quo to such a degree that it would be better in their best interest if they just got rid of this upstart, brash, bold rabbi from Nazareth. And so they did. They called for his death. And they convicted him against Pilate's will. And they nailed him to a cross amid a jeering crowd where he expired from exposure and loss of blood. His disciples during this time, many of them, most of them, deserted him because they were afraid that the other shoe was about to fall. Even on Easter, after the women come back from the tomb with this story about Jesus' resurrection, they couldn't believe it. They, they discounted it as an idle tale. And even in last week's story, on the road to Emmaus, when Cleopas and likely his wife walked with Jesus and talked with him, and, and he unpacked the entire content of the Jewish scripture in regards to Messiah, and they go back and they tell the crowd, the, the disciples, we have seen the Lord. And, and they're told, in fact, that the women have saw Jesus and, and that Peter has had an, a person-to-person -person encounter with Jesus that, and it only mentions that in Luke's gospel. It doesn't really unpack that for us. And then later in Luke's gospel, it tells us that Jesus is just there in the midst of them in a locked room in this post-resurrection body, no longer constrained by time, very physical, but at the same time, divine in every way. And so during the course of this um, Sunday of Easter, um, one of the messages that the women are told is, is to tell my disciples to go back to Galilee and I'll meet them there. And so today's scene we pick up at about dusk and we have these seven disciples, two of whom are unnamed, gathered by the Sea of Galilee. And they're about to engage in a very familiar activity. They're about to go fishing. How many of y'all like to go fishing? I like to go fishing. My son really likes to go fishing. Mostly he likes to go catching. He doesn't really like to go fishing. But the disciples, they, they didn't get into a boat. They didn't go down to the marina and rent a 14-foot aluminum flat bottom with a 15-horse seven route. They got into the boat, the boat that Peter owned and worked with his brother and his, his dad. And they go out on, onto the lake at, at dark because that's when these people fish. And they cast the nets all night long, and they don't catch anything. They don't catch anything. It is no fun to fish for more than 30 minutes without catching anything. But there's this, there's this little mechanism in humanity where when we feel really overwhelmed, when we're stressed, when things aren't going right at home or at work, when we watch the news and everything seems to be bad, there's this little mechanism in us that just wants to get just to have a moment of peace and quiet. Yesterday, from 8 o'clock until 4.30, I was in that fellowship hall, and it was filled with people. In fact, if everybody was there here that was there, there wouldn't be enough room for everybody. We'd be putting out chairs in the, in the middle and on the side aisles. I mean, there was a lot of people. And at some point in the afternoon, I just got a little overwhelmed with all the noise and the busyness. And I'd gone around and politicked and met people and schmoozed and offered to help folks and caught up. And I just needed a minute, okay, just a minute. And so I went into the youth room, and I closed that hallway door, and I went into the youth room, and I closed that outside door, and I laid down on the couch for a minute and, and just soaked up the quiet for just a few minutes. And, and just laid there, maybe 10 minutes, I don't know, couldn't have been much more than that. And then I finally, I felt okay, I felt like I could go back outside and finish what needed to be done. And, and I, I noticed that after I came out, there were some of those kids that had been there all day. They went back there for a while, too. They needed a little break, a little peace and quiet from all the busyness that was going on. 
And so that's, that's a lot of what Peter and these disciples are doing. It's, it's, really, um, it's really easy to see that Peter is the leader of this group, that you know he's the one that initiates, hey, let's go fishing, and, and they all just fall in with him. But I can't imagine um, on that lake, because let me tell you something, that lake is kind of up in the mountains, and it's, and it's above sea level quite a bit, and um, there's not a lot of ambient light there unless you're in Tiberias, unless you're in the city. There's just not a whole lot of ambient light. And apparently Israel's a whole lot, uh, they're a whole lot more frugal with their electricity than we are here in this country. Because when they shut the business down, it's like there's no lights around it. Even behind the hotel, you could go back there and there just wasn't a lot of light. There was, And you could really see the stars and and I can imagine them on that boat, the waves kind of lapping the side of the boat, and the boat swaying, and they're in this familiar routine, and they're throwing out the net, and they're pulling it back, and they're throwing out the net, and they're pulling it back. And, it, and maybe at some point they throw out the net, and they just let it sit there because they know they're going to pull it back, and it's going to be empty. And, you know, they just kind of alone with their thoughts, maybe some small talk going on between them. Imagine being there with them because... You've been pretty overwhelmed over the course of the past few weeks. And then as the sun begins to to rise, and they're bringing their nets in probably for the last time, and they're starting to pull the boat toward home, and, and they hear through the mist of the lake, they hear this call, have you caught any fish? And they shout back no and and the voice says throw the net on the other side of the boat and you'll catch some and they throw the net on the other side of the boat and the text tells us that it is so full of fish it's almost to the point of bursting and if you go back and look at the fifth chapter of Luke you'll see a similar a similar story and I can't help but wonder if the person who wrote John's gospel he, he wants us to remember that. He wants us to get that because that's when Jesus tells Peter, when Peter says, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. Um, Jesus says, don't worry, Peter, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And, and he gave him a mission and they went about that mission for three years. And so this day they bring in these fish and, and there's only one disciple out of all of them that is aware enough about what's going on to realize who it is on the shore, and that's the beloved disciple. And, and, and we wonder, well, how come it's only, it's only this particular person? Well, this particular person followed Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. This particular person was at the foot of the cross with the women when everybody else was gone. We know that because Jesus tells him to take care of his mother once he's gone. And he makes this this sort of a contract or covenant between his mother and John. And John takes care of her for the rest of her life. And, And so we know John is there. And we know that John was there on resurrection morning. He was one of the disciples along with Peter that ran back to the tomb and went in and and, and it tells us that he believed. And I believe the reason that John realized, recognized who Jesus was is because John had spent some time next to Jesus. He had spent some time in prayer and reflection. He had experienced, along with these other disciples, the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. But it somehow connected with him in a deeper level. Somehow... This meant more to him than it did to the rest of them. And there's this awareness that comes from spending time with God. How many of you know that we oftentimes encounter God in in a face or a person or a circumstance, a blessing? And, And we fail to recognize who it is. And maybe sometime later that day or sometime later in our life, we go, wow, that was God. God showed up and I didn't even realize it at the time. And in in order for us to really recognize who Jesus is, we have to spend some time. It's like, you know, it's like living with somebody and you hear them, you know when they're hurting, you know when they're happy. You can hear it in their voice because you stay with them all the time. You're familiar with those tones and inflections and you know what their face looks like and you know what it feels like to hug them and to tell them that you love them because you know them. 
You can recognize them without even having to see them. And Peter, Peter needs to get back to Jesus. Like he really needs to get back to Jesus. And, and, he, and he's stripped to the waist for doing the work. And he didn't feel a need to put his clothes on, clothes on until he's going to the shore. And you're thinking, well, why does he put his coat on and, and jump in the water? I don't know. Maybe he thought he was going to walk on water. I don't know. You know, he almost did it that one time. Maybe he thought he was going to do it again. But he couldn't appear in front of Jesus um, without any clothes on. That's The Jewish people are very modest, and they just, that's, you just don't do that. You don't go in front of your rabbi unless you're fully, completely clothed. And so Peter gets there, and there's this, I would love, like that passage in Luke, when it tells us that Jesus has appeared to Peter, I would love to know this private conversation that had to have gone on between the two of them while the other disciples, the other six, are rowing the boat to the shore. There's, there's like this moment. And, and Peter doesn't have to be told it's Jesus. He knows it's Jesus. But the text is silent for us. It doesn't tell us anything. And, and Peter notices that there's bread and fish being cooked on a charcoal fire. And, and they, the other group gets the, the boat and the fish to the shore. And they're, they're excited. They, they don't have to ask who it is either. They know it's Jesus. And, and Jesus asks for some of the fish that they've caught. And Peter brings them. And then Jesus, without a word, begins to serve a meal to them. There's, there's like reminiscence of this in the Last Supper. And, and the writer wants us to know that the Last Supper is not the last meal that Jesus spends with his disciples. Um, there's, there's also overtones of the Eucharist, the, the Lord's Supper, where Jesus blesses the bread and he breaks it and he gives it to his disciples. There's a reminder of the feeding of the 5,000. Remember, Jesus took that little bit of bread and fish and he breaks it and gives it to his disciples and they feed a multitude and there's, there's more than they began with left over. Peter needs to get to Jesus because he needs to somehow get past this disassociation that he had with Jesus. When Jesus tells him that he's going to deny him three times before the rooster crows, Peter said, I'll, I'll go to prison for you, I will die for you. And one of the Gospels records for us a very poignant moment in this, in this evening when for the last time, Peter denies his Lord, and, and he and Jesus make eye contact. Think about the weight of that for a minute. And, and Peter goes out, and it says he weeps bitterly. And, and Peter doesn't see Jesus alive again. He's truly disassociated himself from the rabbi. In fact, his going fishing, um, this, this resumption of this um, trade, is really proof that he's no longer a Talmudine, no longer a follower of Jesus. But he needs to get to Jesus. He needs, he needs to speak with Jesus. He needs to be reconnected. And he's had the courage to get out of the boat for the second time. He's had the courage to go in the presence of one who he denied. He has the courage to receive the meal and to sort of have this quiet moment where nobody's talking. And it's not like the upper room where they're afraid and they're locked in. It's, it's out in the country and the wind is blowing and the sun's coming up and you can smell the fish and you can taste the bread and, and everything for a moment just feels right. You understand? It, it's not just a church picnic. It's, it's like, it feels like it used to feel. And, and Jesus comes and has this conversation with Peter. And the Catholic faith call this the primacy of Peter. Where Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? He asked him three times. Three times he asks him, do you love me? And the third time the text specifically tells us that Peter is hurt. And I believe the reason Peter is hurt is because he realizes he's been given the opportunity to, to reconnect with the rabbi. 
He's, he's about to be recommissioned to go out into the world to lead the Christian church, to be, um, according to the apostolic tradition, the first, the first elder, the first pope of, of the church. And Jesus offers him that opportunity to reconnect. And so we have, we have courage, we have compassion coming from Jesus, and then we have this connection. And it's not only with Jesus, but it's a connection with these other disciples. And it's a connection with a broader ministry because these fish, these 153 fish, the Jewish people recognized 153 nations in the civilized world and, and they were about to be sent out to all the world. Um, when, when the Sea of Galilee is referred to in this text, it says the Sea of Tiberias, that's the Greek reference because the, the writer wants us to know they're being sent out into the whole world. That passage of scripture is for me my life verse, that, that section where Jesus is speaking to Peter, that's where um, God reaffirmed my call to ministry in my 40s um, at a party in my preacher's house. And, and I remember sitting there and we're just having a casual conversation. And I don't know, it's, it's a group of people that we were in a small group with and things were just, I mean, it was just a Friday. We're just there with our friends. And the, and the minister turns and looked at me and, and said, just how long have you been dodging the call to ministry? And then turned and began to have her conversation. I mean, it was just a moment for me when there was a clear understanding of what my life was going to be about from that moment forward. And I got up and left because I was overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed. I was gone so long... I was standing in the front yard under the shade of a tree and my wife came out and she said, are you okay? I looked at her like she had three heads. I said, did you hear what she said? She goes, yeah. She said, and if you're called to ministry, I'll go with you. I don't care what it means. If that's what God has in store for us, then that's what we'll do. And a few days later in my Bible reading, I read that passage of scripture and God just impressed on me pressed on me. That was my calling. And like Peter, I've been very impetuous in my adult life. I've done things that I'm not proud of, stupid things. I denied my Savior so many times, so many times. God is a God of second chances and third chances and hundredth chances. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And, and we don't have to be worried about whether we're good enough because God knows who we are and he knows we're not good enough. And you know what? He loves us anyway. He loves us so much he won't leave us where we're at. Somebody under the sound of my voice, I don't know, maybe Paisley, maybe Samantha, I don't know, maybe Eli, maybe one of you adults, Somebody is being called to a deeper commitment, a deeper level of discipleship. God wants to use you in a very unexpected way. And I don't know who it is. I don't know why it is. It's up to you to answer that call. It's up to you to be willing to stand up and talk about your life story and be vulnerable. Do you know that's one of the things that you all like the most about my preaching? It's because I'm just a regular human being. And I'm, reg I'm, I'm regular enough to share what God's done in my life. And that's all he needs from you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the 